Okay. The gifts of the spirit. We're going to begin there. And this is going to take us to different, different places. Also, you're going to see things in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians that you've probably never seen before, or maybe you've never even heard before, because I know uh, this is a deep, is a thorough teaching, and um, you're going to get a lot out of it. So if you have a pen and paper, you, you can take notes. I suggest you take notes, because you won't be able to see the video again. However, you'll be able to play back the audio you can go back to the conference call line there's a playback number i posted on the event page you can dial the conference call number and there's a playback you can always hear the playback uh if you don't if you don't get everything you can't catch it on one shot if it's too much for you it's overwhelming it's going over your head you could always go back hear it on the conference call and play it back and then you, it'll, it'll resonate this is a teaching that if it's, if it's very thorough it's very deep and it's, it's going to get you to the meat and potatoes of study if you like studying the word of god well you came to the right session because we don't just preach here we dig deep into the word and i need you to get just focus on what i'm saying tonight okay so we're going to begin by starting with first corinthians chapter 12 verse 1. in the beginning we're going to start by saying god wants you to move in the supernatural god wants you to move in the supernatural first corinthians 12 1 says this now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. I would not have you to be ignorant. Okay, so what is this telling us? Basically, is this. Believers must, be, remain, must not remain ignorant of the gifts of the Spirit, their proper use, or their purpose. I'm going to repeat that. Believers must not remain ignorant of the gifts of the Spirit, their proper use, or their purpose. What was going on here? that Paul, when he was writing this book to the Corinthians, many of them were ignorant to the fact of the spiritual gifts. They didn't know much about it. The Corinthian culture was very uh, worldly. They just came out of idolatry, all kinds of pagan. Uh, they will have pagan, uh, what do you call those things, brothels. And they were full of fornication and idolatry. They were a big messed up church. And what was going on, there was a lot of confusion in the church. And a lot of things they didn't know was spiritual gifts. So what Paul does, he writes a letter to them, being they are a church and, and they are carnal, but still in all, he writes the letter and he tells them, listen, I don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. I want you to know something. Okay, I, first thing is this, I don't want you to be ignorant. So what does it mean to be ignorant? The word ignorant from the text is from the Strong's Concordance. If you have the Strong's Concordance, you can look it up later. It's the number 50, 5 The word ignorant, according to the text, is this, to lack experience or practical training or to ignore through the lack of desire or interest. So watch this, to lack experience and practical training. The Corinthians, what they did was that. They were ignorant, they lacked experience, and they lacked practical tr understanding. And this is what happens when we look at the text for ourselves of a New Testament church as a 2016 church. What we're seeing here is that we see the same thing, that we're lacking experience and we're lacking practical understanding when it comes to the spiritual gifts. If you look at your church, many times, many pastors and apostles and prophets or what have you, they don't know too much when it comes to the gift of the Spirit. They don't teach too much. I'm not saying that they don't, but they don't teach too much on the gifts of the Spirit. And I don't know why. And I think it's maybe because they have another agenda because maybe they want to get something else. I don't know. Maybe it's because they want to please the people. Listen, you're going to be in a lot of churches don't want to hear about spiritual gifts. Most church people are comfortable just going to service, getting their shout on, get past it, putting money in the bucket, and going home and go eat a Denny's. That's the modern-day church. They don't want to really get involved. They really don't want to do much. Okay, so if you're here in this call, God's going to challenge you. So whatever you hear, now you're liable. So God's going to push you to do something. This is not just for you just to hear and, oh, that's a nice teaching. But God's going to put you, put you in position because now you're going to be well-equipped with the word of God, and now he's going to challenge you because he's going to show you things in the Bible. So again, the Corinthian church was lost. They didn't understand anything. There was a lot of confusion, a lot of immorality, but still in all, the, uh, the apostolic anointing on Paul, he writes his letters to set order. Why? Because most the majority of apostles is to govern the church and to set order in the church, and this is what we see Paul doing. So he tells them, I don't want you to be ignorant to this fact, and God tells us the same thing. He doesn't want us to be ignorant to the fact of spiritual gifts. It's very, very vital. It helps the church. It grows the church. You can't get much out of the church without a spiritual gift. 
If you don't have a spiritual gift in your church, you are lacking. Now, if you, if you have a gift, it is important that you utilize your gift in your church. Maybe you're in a church, they don't allow you to prophesy. They don't let you heal the sick. Maybe they don't let you do anything. But still in all, you have to be in a place that you're able to exercise your gift. Why? Because God gave you that gift. He didn't give you a gift to put in your pocket or put on the shelf. No, he gave you a gift so you could utilize that gift. What would it be any use of something? You, if I gave you a gift, so let's say for your birthday or for Christmas or for your anniversary or what have you, you took that gift and you, you put it away in a closet and you shut the door. I would look like I would get insul- I would really get insulted. And I'm like, what, yeah. what's wrong with that person? What is this person, you know, they don't appreciate the gift I gave them? So I kind of understand what the Holy, Holy Spirit is trying to say. Hey, I've given you a gift. Actually, there's nine of them. There's nine gifts of the Spirit. So why don't you do this? Take the gift that I've given you. It's free. And utilize it in the church. It's not just for you to, oh, and just say, oh, I got a gift. But it's no use if you're not using it. So what God wants us to do, my friends, is to utilize the gift that he has given us. Now, God wants us to be informed about operate effectively in the gifts of the spirit again he wants us to be informed about it and how do we get informed about it by the word of god first corinthians chapter 12 first corinthians chapter 13 first corinthians chapter 14 these are three vital verses you want to concentrate on when you're talking about gifts of the spirit you don't want to start reading all books of the bible because you want to look spiritual you want to get deep stay in those three chapters and you will learn so much even romans chapter 12 has some issues when it comes to gifts of the spirit some offices are mentioned in Romans chapter 12. So that's a bonus chapter. Oh. But again, you want to stay focused on 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. I hear noise. Please, please mute your phone. Please mute your phone. Star 6 if you're on the call. Okay. Now, the gifts of the Spirit are what? They're supernatural. They're supernatural. 1 Corinthians 12 and 7 says this. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Who's each one? Each one is you. Each one is me. Each one is everyone, including the men on front of the pulpit. It's given to the, everyone for the profit of all. Everyone should be benefiting from a spiritual gift that is in the church. So what happens now? We are, or you should say, you are a spirit living in a body uniquely designed to express the presence and life of God on earth. You have a spirit man. That spirit man became regenerated, rejuvenated once you became born again. Jesus Christ came into your life. We know what's happened. You've been rejuvenated. And now your spirit is aligned with the spirit of the Holy God. So now what does he want to do? He wants to put you in action. He doesn't want you to stay stagnant. So God clearly desires that each believer to manifest the life and power of the Holy Spirit. So what do I mean by that? Well, when we read the text in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, look at it again. It says, but the manifestation of the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. What does he mean? The word manifestation in the Strong's is 5321. What does it mean? To be clearly visible, a supernatural activity of the Holy Spirit. It has to be clearly visible. It has to be manifested. You have to see it. It doesn't, it's, not, it's, not, it's one thing about talking about a gift, but what, we want to see the gift. We want to see it in operation. We want to see it in action. Amen? So it says each one, stay in that text, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Look at it. Read it again. Each one, meaning every believer has this privilege to express the gift of the Spirit. Every believer, not just the pastor, not just the deacon, not just the elder, every person in the pew Every person in the pulpit, in the pulpit, has to exercise. They have the privilege of exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're not anybody's not special, more special, more anointed. No, we are all the equal. We are all the same. Only thing we have different is positions in the church. But the Holy Spirit looks at us as one body, as it says, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Now it says here the gifts, the gifts, the word gifts from the Strong's is fifty four eighty six. What is the gift? It's grace. Your gift is a grace. It's given to you. You didn't pay for it. You didn't ask, you didn't just uh, you know, say, you know, listen, I'm going to pay for this, and then you're going to uh, give me my gift. Like most people, what they'll do, I've seen this time and time again, what they want is somebody to pay them, and then they'll pray for you. They have the prayer line, $50 prayer line. You got the $50 prophecy room, and all this, all this malarkey when it's not of God. 
So if anyone tells you, if you come into my prayer circle and now you give him sow me a seed, you'll get a gift. I don't know about that. That's a fishy character if you ask me because the Bible says that gifts are given from the Holy Ghost and they're free. We don't pay for gifts. You can sow a seed. You can bless the church. You can bless the ministry. You can bless me, the man of God teaching you tonight, but I'm not going to say, I'm going to say, you give me, give me a gift, then now you're going to get a gift. No, it doesn't work like that. Only God is going to give gifts. Now, it says for the prophet of all. What does he mean? Paul, what are you talking about, the prophet of all? What does he mean? He means this. In the Strong's, it's 4851. It means this, to benefit people. Your gift, my gift, is to benefit people. It's not to puff ourselves up, not to look more spiritual, not to look more anointed, not whatever. It is for the benefit of your neighbor, your person that's by you, the person maybe that's weak in the faith. Your gift is a strong maybe. You have a gift of this or whatever gift you have. Your gift is not for you. Again, it's for the next person. It's for the benefit. It's for the advancement of the kingdom. That's what the gift is for. The gifts are instituted in the church, and they're advancing the kingdom. That's the reason why God put the gifts in the church. Now, the Holy Spirit distributes the gifts to each person as he wills, as he wills. The Holy Spirit is the one that distributes the gifts. We can't, we can't tell the Holy Spirit what to do. He's going to choose who he wants to give the gifts to. And sometimes what I see happening in the church, and many people say, I want this. I want that. But how come I don't have this? But how come I don't have this gift? I want this gift. Listen, God knows what he's going to do. He knows who you are. He knows your personality. He knows what you have for lunch. He knows exactly what to give you. It's like, again, I go back to Christmas again. You give a child a gift because you know the child. You know what the child needs. You know what the child desires. You know what the child's been begging you for 364 days within the year. So you say, this is what you've been wanting for. This is what I know is going to benefit for you. So this is what I'm going to give you. I'm not going to give you that truck. I'm not going to give you that doll. I'm going to give you what I feel you need because of your age. That's a very important factor, my friends. Sometimes our age, how long we've been saved, determines a lot of things. And I'm not saying you're more spiritual because you've been saved 20 or 30 years. There's some people that have been saved 20 or 30 years, and they act like they've been saved five years or two years. No, I think what God is looking at us to see how much we have developed in time. And as you see how maturity in the faith, he will dispense the spiritual gift to you. Why? Because you don't want to give to him. He doesn't want to overwhelm us with a gift. For example, if you took a, a person in the military, you don't give a machine gun to go out there unless he knows how to handle a weapon. Why? Because he might blow somebody's head off or blow himself up. You don't do that. Why? So God is smarter than that. I think God is pretty smart, if you agree with me. So God is a smart person. He's a smart being. He's a spirit. He knows all things. So he knows exactly what gift to dispense upon his people. So when people cry and say, well, I wish I had this gift, I wish I had gifts, uh, listen, it's whatever the Holy Spirit dispenses. Now, gifts are not an indication of a person's maturity all the time, as I just mentioned. It depends on other factors. God knows exactly who to give what. Now, it's also not a sign that one, uh, one is completely right with God. I want to repeat that. It's not a sign that one's life is completely right with God. Because a person receives a spiritual gift doesn't necessarily mean they have it all together. No, because sometimes they're growing in their faith, and sometimes what we do, we criticize people, we judge them, we throw, we throw rocks at them. We don't even know what God is doing. So just because they have something, say, but when? That person, how come that person has that gift? I'm more spiritual than they are. I give more than they are. I'm holier than thou. I do more than this. But still, why does he have that gift? Why does she have that gift? And I don't. Well, God knows what he's doing. Back to square one. He knows that in the, in the, in the, at the end of the day, God is so sovereign. He knows what he's going to do, and that's maybe five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. He knows that that person is going to come to full maturity. So God is no respect of a person, number one, and he knows exactly how to dispense the gift. So he will do that. And so don't freak out because you see somebody on TV and you say, well, I know that person's business. I know all his dirty laundry. Why is he on TV? Why is he living like this? Why is he living large? Listen, leave that up to God. Leave it up to God. I don't agree with a lot of things I see in the church, but who am I? All I can do is pray for these people. Now, gifts are not given, they're earned. Oh, I'm sorry, the gifts are not, they're given, not earned. Again, like I mentioned before, you don't earn it. There's nothing you can do. You can stand on top of your head. You can fast for 50, 20, 100 days. Don't make, it doesn't make a difference. People always say, well, listen, I was on a call today. I was watching a, a video from, on Periscope. You don't know me on Periscope. I'm a very active person on Periscope. Uh, and the, the prophetess, I heard her say, well, somebody asked her a question. And she said, well, if you fast 
do this, do that, and all these formulas, she says, well, then God will give you uh, whatever. I feel God, I, I kind of lost interest with her. And she, she said, oh, God will give you this. Listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something. You got to catch this. The only time that fasting is issued that Jesus Christ himself told people to do when it came, only when it came to demonic warfare. When it comes to spiritual warfare, Jesus says, this kind can only come out with fasting and praying. This kind. What is this kind? Well, it's the spirit. It's an evil spirit that causes you to go into fasting and prayer. When it comes to spiritual gifts, you don't get it because you fast for it. I want to make that clear. So don't let anybody tell you that. If you don't have a problem, you have a problem with that, read your Bible. It doesn't say anywhere in the New Testament that if you, because a person did this, a person did that, they got a spiritual gift. If you recall the Apostle Paul, he was way from being spiritual. The Bible says he was killing people, especially the church, and what have you. The grace of God came upon the Apostle Paul, not because he was a Jew, but because God had a mission for him. So again, a person, a, a gift are not given, they, they are not earned. God dispenses them whomever he wants to and when he wants to. And also, what they also have done, gifts are received by act of faith. Gifts are received by act of faith. Now, I want you now to go down to, we're going to read 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. And it says this. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Verse 8. For one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, act of faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. But, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing them to each one individually as he wills, as we read. Now, although each gift has its own unique function, it is helpful to consider them in three different categories of operation. Now, this is what they, the gifts of the Spirit are broken into three categories. For example, number one, there is the gift of revelation. If you're taking notes, you may want to write that down. The gift of revelation. What does that mean? Well, is information previously hidden and is made known. Those are, these are the type of gifts. They call revelation gifts. What are they? Well, number one, word of knowledge. We just read them in the text. It may have got, you might, that went, may have got right by you, but word of knowledge is one. Word of wisdom is an un, another one. And discerning of spirits. Those are three categories as far as the gifts of revelation in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Then... You have the gift of utterance, meaning something is spoken. You have, number one, the prophecy. As we read, you have diverse kinds of tongues, and then you have interpretation of tongues. Those, those are the three uh, components in that factor. Then there is the gift of power, the gift of power, which is something supernaturally done, and power is imparted. How is that so? Well, there's a gift of faith. There's gifts of healing, and then there's working of miracles. So those are the three components when it comes to the gift of power. Now, let's ask ourselves a question, an intelligent one at that. Is, how do the gifts work together? How do the gifts work together? Well, the gifts work together like this. Revelation plus word spoken plus act of faith is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I'll read that again. Revelation plus word spoken plus act of faith equals the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Now, can all believers operate in all the gifts? Well, that's another good question. Let's find out. Go with me, if you will, to Mark chapter 16, and we're going to look at something what Jesus said. Mark chapter 16, and we'll read verses 17 and 18. I'll give you a moment to get there. Okay, Mark 16, 17, and 18 says this. And these signs will follow those who believe. You got to see exactly what it says in the text. Not, not anything else. We don't put anything in the text. And it says, 
In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will no, by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Who's speaking? Jesus Christ is speaking. So within the gifts of the spirit, we see this. We are to cast out demons. Jesus gave us the authority to cast out demons. Listen, he told us, well, how do we fall, fall into that category of casting out demons? What do they fall under? They fall under the what? The discerning of spirits, the working of miracles, and faith. So what we see here, when we're doing one action, they're falling into three different categories. I'm going to say that again. When we're doing one thing as far as casting out devils or demons, we are actually operating in three different components. Discerning of spirits, working of miracles, and faith. Think about it for a minute. Well, think about that for a moment, what I just told you. Now, when we speak in new tongues, as Jesus said, we do what? We speak in tongues, and sometimes there may be interpretation of tongues. That is a blessing to have that gift. Sometimes myself, I receive, have received that, but not all the time. Only God will distribute that gift to me at a certain time or a certain place that he will allow me to interpret the gift of tongues. My wife also has had the opportunity many times to do that herself. In the last uh, meeting we went to, the, I think it was the, the bishop was speaking in tongues or his wife, who's your prophetess, and she interpreted their tongue. And it was amazing. Okay, so when we read that text, we also have to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to go back there. We're going to look at something else here. We're going to go through 7 through 11. We're going to, not going to read it again because we just read it. But what we're going to do is examine a verse in the text, actually in the chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In verse 5, it says, so that you will not come, I'm sorry, so that you short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that, verse 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. First Corinthians, don't even, don't even go there. That's the wrong verse. Stay where you're at. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 1, 5. My mistake. It says, so that you come in short and no gift. Just listen. Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what am I saying? Basically, it's this. The Holy Spirit is present in every believer to help them produce the maximum they can for the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit was going to produce the maximum effect of what you do, what you have. He's going to take all of it out of you. Not just part. He's going to get as much, much out of you because he's put a lot of stock in us. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. He lives in us. He, he resides in us. So he's going to get his money. What did he say? He's going to put, get his money's worth. Ever you ever had that term before, I'm going to get my money's worth? Well, guess what? The Holy Ghost is going to get his money's worth within us. Not just you, not just I, we're any believer. Okay? Now, I want you to, uh, should we go here? Let's go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. I'm going to read this because it's, it's a good text to read. So I went to the first Corinthians, but we're going to go back there again. So what you want to do, I wish I have told you, leave your place. If you have a marker or a bookmark, you may want to put your bookmark in first Corinthians 12 because we're going to be flipping back and forth to that. I should have told you ahead of time, but still in all, keep first Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, open, so to speak. Okay, Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 18. It says this, and I'm reading from the New King James. He says, Now there was a certain disciple at the Damascus named Ananias. And to, and, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise, and go to the street called Straight. And inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many things about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind up all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer 
for my name's sake. Verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me on your way. I'm sorry, that sent me, that's, I'm sorry. He has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, you have to understand something about this gentleman named Ananias. He was a nobody. You don't hear about him anywhere else. You don't hear him about him in any of the Gospels. You don't hear about him in any of the verses of Scripture. He's a nobody who became a somebody in Jesus. It's a, it's a miracle what God does. God uses whoever he uses. And I always say, if he uses a donkey, he uses me. So what we see here, since he's an ordinary person, God used him to minister healing and baptism in the spirits of Paul. So what does that tell us? Since, since you may be on this call and say, well, I'm an ordinary person. I don't have a position in the church. Well, guess what? You're a candidate for to use, God can use you. Not just the man of God, the man of the pulpit. You're a good candidate because you're just like that. You're just like an Ananias. You're on this call and say, well, listen, I don't do much. Guess what? You can do a lot because what I just mentioned, the Holy Spirit is in you. He gives you all the power. He wants to get as much stock out of you. So in this case, we see a man, an ordinary disciple, who God uses to heal, for healing, now watch this, and baptism of the Spirit to Paul. Healing. Some people say, well, I don't have that gift. How do you know? Have you ever tried, have you ever tried it? Have you ever laid hands on somebody? Jesus said, lay, hand on, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So why don't you give it a shot one day and see what happens? And you never know. You may have that gift. You never know. Ananias probably didn't even know he had it himself until he obeyed what God told him to do. And once Ananias obeyed the word of the Lord and go do what God called him to do, he just did what God told him to do, and God did the rest. That's all. It's very simple. You do what God tells you to do, and God will take care of the rest. It's all him, not us. It's all him. Now, we operate in five gifts. What, what are they? Well, number one, we've been writing notes. Here they are. Word of knowledge. Wisdom, prophetic utterance, faith, and healing. Note how the miracle happened. Again, I'm going to repeat this like I did the last time. Revelation plus word spoken plus act of faith equals manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I repeat that. Revelation plus word spoken equal, or plus act of faith equals the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12 again. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Like I said before, leave a marker there. Now, we're going to look at believers' responsibilities concerning the gifts of the Spirit. Believers' responsibilities. Now, eventually, we're going to get into the prophetic prophecy, prophesying, but I have to lay a foundation like right here. I just can't jump into something. I got to lay a foundation. This teaching is going to take you step by step. So by the time you're finished, like I said before, you're going to be well equipped. You're going to know when anybody asks you a question, you're going to teach them. You're going to have your own class. Trust me. So again, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So look at insights here. God gives gifts of the Spirit. God gives gifts of the Spirit to every believer. God must expect something from us, and it's my responsibility, what? To discover what God expects from me. I'm going to repeat that. That's important. It is my responsibility, it is your responsibility to discover what God expects from me, what God expects from you. That's our responsibility. That's not the leader's, that's not the really this responsibility. But what happens is this, my friend. We're asking the people in the church, what do you think my gift is? Can you please tell me? I don't know what your gift is. Why don't you have you asked, have you ever asked God? Have you ever got on your knees and prayed and say, Lord, what is my gift? But the problem is that we're too lazy and we want everybody to do, uh, do our dirty work. We want, to, we want to say, hey, man, pray for me. Do this for me. Do that for me. I got to go to work. Well, you know, that's taking the shortcut. And God's not interested in everybody doing your dirty work, myself included. He doesn't want us to do that. He wants you to come to him. He says, no good thing he will withhold for them that walk it rightly. So if he's not going to withhold anything from you. What are you afraid of? Don't be afraid. Ask for the gift. The Bible says in Hebrews to come boldly before the throne of grace. So take him at his word. Go for it, man. Do it. Take him for his word. Be bold. Go up there and say, Lord, 
What's my gift? What do you want me to do? Where do I belong in the church? And he'll tell you. He'll, he'll tell you or he'll show you. Either way, you'll find out. You'll find out. Now, there's five responsibilities of the believer. For example, we have to learn how to flow in the Holy Ghost. We have to, we have to learn how to flow. We have to learn. We, we, let's us, let's, we, we need to learn. Let's, let's us learn. We need to learn. Don't tell me. I got to find out. I have to learn. Okay. If I have to find out, it's, it's important. So again, verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. Now, listen to this. God expects us to cultivate and develop our capacity to flow in the Holy Ghost. God expects us to cultivate our gifts. What do I mean by cultivate? Well, it's to take care of the ground. If you cultivate a garden, you water it, you plant it, you, you put all kinds of things in it to make the, the, the soil rich and, and fertile and grow and healthy. You, you invest something in the soil, and then you put your, your, your plant, you put it by the sun, so it gets sunlight. It gets water. So the same way we have to water ourselves, our spirit, through prayer and through the word of God, through worship, through all the above, so we cultivate our garden. The problem that we're doing is that we're cultivating our garden once a week. Oh, you didn't, I know you didn't like that one. What we're doing is cultivating our gardens on, on Sunday. And then Monday through Saturdays, we're doing other things. We're not investing in the garden. We're not building the garden. And then all of a sudden, we want to have a beautiful tree. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We have to cultivate the garden for the garden to look good and the garden to grow. We have to put some stock in it. We have to spend some time. We can't expect somebody else to do the dirty work and then stuff up. And before you know it, we want a great ministry, and we haven't even prayed. We haven't even fasted. We haven't done this. We haven't done all these things that people told do, but we haven't even done even the simplest things like read the word and pray. And then, again, we want all this stuff coming to us. Okay. Now, he says, earnestly desire the best gift. Earnestly desire the breast kids. Where do we see that? 1 Corinthians 12, 31. Go a little bit further down. Look at verse 31 in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at it. It says, but earnestly desire the best gifts. The what gifts? The better ones. There are greater gifts. If God is telling us to seek the best gifts, don't seek the lesser ones. Seek the better ones. Seek the powerful gifts. The power gifts. There's gifts mentioned, as I mentioned, in 1 Corinthians, but there's even more gifts in Romans chapter 12 as well. So there's also gift of mercy and just gifts and healing, I mean, helps and all this stuff. But I don't want to, I don't want mercy. I don't want administration. I don't want a help gift. I want a powerful gift. I want healing. I want this. I want to cast out devils. I want to do all this stuff. So Lord, give me those gifts. I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to get it, but I want it. I may not get it, but I'm going to desire it. So he tells them not only to desire it, but earnestly desire it. Now, what did I mean by earnest? What did he mean by earnestly desire? The strong reference is this, 2206. 2206. Look up that word, zealous. Zealous means to be passionate. Passionate, to contend with, to excel. Strongly exert yourself in the pursuit of something you want. Again, strongly exert yourself in the pursuit of something you want. It's okay to want it. You can pursue it. And listen. You might even get it. Let's see. You could be, you know, you desire it. I'm not saying do something like, uh, it's one thing to desire something. It's one thing to do all, go do crazy things to get it. I'm not telling you, like I said before, I'm not talking about going out and do things, but you could desire from the heart. I'm not saying doing it from the flesh. Like go do this and go do this and go do that and go do this. Like a Jehovah's Witness. They, get, they think they get browning points in heaven because they walk around and give out tracts. God is not concerned with that. He's going to be strong with your inner man most than everything else. God wants, you in, wants to build you from the inside out. The outward will deal with the outward, with outward later. So he wants to deal with you from the inside first. So eagerly desire from the heart, not from the flesh. Okay? That's what he means. To be passionate, to contend, to excel. Strongly exert yourself to the pursuit of something you want. It's like when you want that, that beautiful woman, you're single, you're dating. You, I want that woman... She's so beautiful. I want her. I want her to be my wife or vice versa. If you're single. You're, you're a woman. I love that man. He's a, I love him. I want to I desire to be with him. You see, you eagerly desire because it comes from the heart, it's not from the flesh. Although some people want it from the flesh too. That's another topic. But anyway, listen, flowing 
in the gifts of the Spirit, results of the manifestation of the Spirit of God through us. So what do we do in that? We bring heaven to earth. Now, now I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Turn right. A few books over. 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 6. 2 Timothy 1, 6 says this. Paul writing to Timothy in the second letter. He's in a jail cell. He don't got much time left, but still in all, he has a hope. And he gives some good advice to Timothy in verse 6 in chapter 1. He says, therefore, I remind you, circle the word if you have to, remind you. Sometimes God needs to remind us of things. Hello? Therefore, I remind you, Timothy. Now, Timothy is a pastor. You mean that the pastors need to be reminded? Oh, yes, they do. This is where it is. Paul's reminding Timothy of something. He says, therefore, I remind you. Remind me of what, Paul? I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. You do what? Stir up the gift of God that's in you, Timothy. How do I do that? Oh, well, it's like, look at it this way. If you have a glass of milk and you want to make chocolate milk, you pour the syrup in the, what happens? It goes to the bottom. It resides in the bottom. But you won't get chocolate milk until you stir up the chocolate. Once you stir it up, the chocolate comes up and you have chocolate milk. Then it's edible. Then you can use it. Then it is what it is. So God tells us the same thing. Stir up the gifts of God that are within you. How do I do that, Apostle? Well, again, vital components through worship and through prayer, through an intimate relationship with God. We stay connected with God on a continual basis, on a constant basis, not on a weekly basis. We're stirring ourselves up and we're keeping ourselves stirred. It's like John Eckhart has said. I never forget. He says, I stay stirred up because I prophesy every day. And it's true. I've watched him on Periscope. Every day he has been prophesying. He does two or three Periscopes a day. The man's prophesying so much, and I thought I did. He must be prophesying in his sleep. And he's stirring <laughs> up his gifts. He's keeping them fresh. He's keeping them on fire. It's like, it's like uh, uh, the word stirred up, if you want to write this down, the t- Strong's is 329. 329. What does it mean? It means to kindle, look at, look at a flame. To kindle glowing embers back into a roaring fire. It's like when you have a fireplace. It says to kindle glowing embers back into a roaring fire. Fire. These are people, they didn't have what we have. They have fire, y'all. That's how they cook their meals. That's how they lit up their house. They understand the concept. Timothy knows what the concept means to stir up a gift. In the text, in the Greek, it means to bring up like a fire. Bring up that flame again like a roaring fire. So what is he telling to? It means to ignite a flame or a level of passion. It's to ignite it and make, it, make that thing come like so, so high it could burn the roof. Now, a fire, it says, is usually rekindled step by step by providing fresh fuel and air. That's how fire, it gets even, um, it gets even higher. If you, look in the, if you look at a movie, I, I think I saw it on that movie uh, one time. I forgot the name of it with John Travolta. It was called, I think, Ladder something. And it's weird because I think it was called Backdraft. No, Backdraft. There's a movie called Backdraft that when they opened up the door, the, the air that came up, it made the fire explode. It made the fire just ignite even higher. So it says again that fire is usually rekindled step by step by providing fresh fuel or air. Air will rekindle fire. And what I mean by air? The Holy Ghost? Is, is, you have to just be in an atmosphere where you could kindle the flame that can come out. And then I'm not talking about a, a building. I'm talking about the inner you has to be kindled, a rise up. It's like when you put gasoline or ignite a fluid, poof, it blows up. So that's what God wants us to do. Blow up in the inside of the spirit. Blow up. That's how bad, that's how, that's how deep that is. Now, I want you to go to First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter five. First Thessalonians chapter five. Quickly. First Corinthians. I'm sorry. First Thessalonians five nineteen. 
Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica, which was a good church, a healthy church, a giving church. They were better than the Corinthians, I'll tell you that much. They had more going on. Even Paul was so impressed with them that he wrote letters of them of the second coming of Christ. You see that in the second letter. So he was pretty impressed with them. They were a good church. So anyway, he says this, but there's an issue here. There are nobody's, there's no perfect church. You see, that was the problem with them, the only problem they had, they had a problem with prophecy. It reminds a lot of churches. They, they, we got a, good, a lot of good churches out there, but they have a problem with prophecy. The church of Thessalonica was one of them. They were a good church, healthy church, giving church, but they had one issue. They weren't too keen on prophecy. So what does Paul tell them? He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, do not quench the spirit. He gives them two commands, very, very to the point. He doesn't beat around the bush. Do not quench the spirit. In verse 20, do not despise prophecies. Man, he hit the head up. He hit him, he hit him right in the face. He hit the nail on the head. Paul wasn't playing. He got to the point. He cut the chase. Listen, don't quench the spirit, he tells them, and don't despise prophecies. What does he mean by quench, Paul? Well, the Strong's number here is 4570, if you want to write that down. To quench means to stifle, suppress, extinguish, or put an end to something. Again, to stifle, suppress, extinguish, or put an end to something burning. Now, here are some things that we have to stifle. And I think these were the things that they were probably need to stifle besides the, the, the things that were hindering them. And they are this, sinful words, attitudes, or actions basically that grieve the Holy Spirit. He's telling us not to quench the spirit, and that's what we do. When we have sinful words, we got to watch our mouth. We have bad attitudes. Basically, they hinder, they grieve the Holy Spirit. Because why? Because the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not an active force like the Jehovah Witness think. He is a person. He can be grieved. He can be hurt. He can do everything. He can feel everything you feel because he's a person. The problem what we do, we, we, we have forgotten that he is a person, and we have taken him out in many of our Christian circles. That's why many dead churches are dead. I always say there's a spirit of Ichabod, meaning the spirit of glory has departed. God is there, but the Holy Ghost jumped ship. He went down to the other church down the corner. Okay. We can also quench the spirit by fear, unbelief, control, and unwillingness to yield. All of these things, excuse me, quench the Holy Spirit. I'll repeat them. Fear, unbelief, control, and unwillingness to yield to who? To authority. We got a problem with authority. We all do, myself included. We need to stop being so stubborn and yield to, sub to submit to authority. Okay, so what else Paul tells him? Let's go back quickly. First Timothy. 414. I need you to see this with your own eyes, so you don't have to take my word for it. First, I'm sorry, First Timothy 414. I think you have to go right again. He says, do not neglect, neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying of hands of the eldership. And then he tells them this. Meditate on these things that, I'm sorry, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. What do you mean, Paul? He says, do not neglect the gift that is in you. What do I mean by neglect? The strongest 272 means what? To be careless about. When you neglect the gift of God that is in you, you are, you are careless. That's what it says here in the Greek. I'm not saying you are. The Bible says we are to make light of, to place little of importance upon so that no effort is made to develop and grow in the gifting. Oh my God. I'm going to read that again. To place little importance upon so that no effort is so made to develop and grow the gifting. That's what it means to be to neglect. Our, neg our negligence in the spirit falls into that category, let's say. Okay? So it takes effort and commitment to develop experience and expert expertize in moving of the gifts of the spirit it takes effort and commitment effort and commitment from whom from you from me we gotta do it 
and they're gonna wake up one morning. We're gonna we're not gonna wake up one morning and you say, oh, okay, a, a, a big light shining on me. All of a sudden, now I just feel like Superman in the spirit. It doesn't grow that way. If it was that easy, I tell you the truth, boy, I, I'll be forget it. I'll be I'll be on cloud nine. Okay, First Corinthians chapter fourteen. First Corinthians chapter fourteen. We're coming to a close here. This is going to be our last verse, and then we're going to tie it up, and then we're going to go to a QA. and a 1 Corinthians 14, 12. Now, we need to excel in building up people. That's what the, the, the chapter is basically speaking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul trying to get the people to excel, not only themselves, but other people. For example, verse 12 says, Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Again, even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, put your name in there. That's you, that's me. Let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. So what does that mean? Well, every believer is called to excel in building up the lives of other people. That's our job to build up our brother and sister in the faith. It's not just the, build, the pastor's job to build everybody up. See, the problem that we have, my friends, we think the church is just a thing that we attend. No, a church is something we are, not something we attend, because church is a build, it's not a building, it's a people. God gives gifts to the spirit because he expects us to be involved in ministry to the life of the spirit to people. This is the reason why you have different gifts to minister to others. Again, it's not for our own edification, it's for others, so they can benefit from your gift. You have a gift, I need what you have, I have a gift, you need what I have. We work together, hand in hand. Iron sharpens iron. I bless you. You bless me. We're blessed people. And finally, again, from that text, the word excel, which is the strong 4052, means to stand out because of having an abundant impact in the building of people. To stand out because of having an abundant impact in the building of people. You have to stand out. It has to be to a point that it stands out. It's, everybody can see the good you are doing, the good you are doing to other people. Amen? So I'm going to stop it right there. And we're going to begin our Q&A. So we're going to start with the people on Tiny, Tiny Chat. If you have any questions, now is your opportunity to let them go and to ask any questions. You can type them in the box there. I will repeat them. And oh, you can send them to me via Facebook Messenger, which I have open, and I'll get them, and then I will read them, and then we, I'll do the best that I can to answer your question. So I'm going to wait a few, maybe 30 seconds to see if you have any questions. If you want to type it out, I'll give you time to type it out. After that, again, I'll go to the call, the conference call, the people who are listening, and I'm going to put it on speakerphone so the people who are watching via live stream can hear your question, and then I will do my best to answer your question. So do we have any questions from the people on Tiny Chat on the, on the live stream? Type fast. It's best to type on the computer because these tiny these cell phones, I can't. I type like a snail. I can't type on a on a cell phone of my life dependent. I tell you, I'm real slow. No questions. Okay. Anyone on the conference call, you can unmute your phone. I'm gonna put you on speaker phone, and you can ask the question. Any questions? You can go right ahead and ask them, and the people can hear you. And I'll do my best to answer any questions based on what you just heard. Anyone on the line? On the conference call line, rather. Praise, praise the Lord. This is Deborah from New Jersey. I have a question. Go ahead. For the, um, for the gifts of the Spirit, where it says, and, and speaking of tongues, because I was always told, I don't want to know to say told or taught, but if, if you didn't speak in tongues, then you didn't have um, evidence of the Holy Spirit inside you. But if it's a gift, and you know, just say it, I wasn't, the Holy Spirit didn't want me to have that gift. I mean, <laughs> so is it uh, that everyone doesn't have to speak in tongues? So your, your question is saying that if you need to have the Holy, you need to have speak in tongues to, to know you have the Holy Spirit? Yeah, some 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 churches uh, that I've been to have said that if you don't speak in tongues, that you don't have evidence of having the Holy Spirit in you. 
No, that's incorrect. Billy right. Graham never spoke tongues in his life. <laughs> Many mm-hmm. people, the Baptist church, they don't speak in tongues. Are mm-hmm. they going to hell? There's a lot of denominations just don't embrace all the gifts of the spirit. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean they don't believe in them. And you see, the problem that we have done, we have taken the scriptures and we have twisted them, and we don't really understand what it means. So mm-hmm. to say that if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit is incorrect. That is not true. Mm-hmm. There are many men and women of God today who are very godly, who have won more souls than more people that do speak in tongues, and they don't even speak in tongues. Like mm-hmm. I said, Billy Graham never spoke in tongues, and look what the masses of people got saved through his ministry. So that's mm-hmm. not that's not that's incorrect. Amen. I, I wish they could show me a verse that says that. I think what they've done, they they see they see verses in the Book of Acts, and they misinterpret the verse, and they just put they read into it what's not there. Mm-hmm. You read into the text what's not there. So that's incorrect. Anyone else? Anyone else on the line? Anyone else on the call, on the screen? Okay, no questions. All right, my friends, that's it. That's a wrap. We thank you. Are you? Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. Okay, that's it. That's a wrap. Thank you for being here. It was a pleasure. We will pick this up on Tuesday, February 2nd, 8 o'clock. We will continue our sessions. We're going into something else. Like I said before, we have laid a foundation of where we're going. I have to lay the foundation so you know what, what's going to happen. Because if I don't lay a foundation as far as spiritual gifts, if I talk to you about the prophetic, some things you're not going to understand. You're going to go right over your head. So we have to take it from the basics, the bare bones, and start from the bottom sometimes. Like I said, when you go to a gym, you just pick up the small weights, and then you work your way up until you start pushing 50 to 100 pounds and 200-pound bench press, bench press. But you don't bench press 200 pounds the first time because you, you'll kill yourself. So when it comes to biblical things, we take it gradually, step by step. The Holy Spirit will illuminate what you've learned, the verses that you've learned, the verses that you read. Go back to them, highlight them, underline them, and see what God will show you. If you want to go back and hear this again, there's a playback number. You go to my Facebook page. There's a, there's a flyer there. There's a number there. There's a different number. The call is the same, but the number is different. You can play it back and hear it again. It's something if I went too fast for you, because I know where everyone too, I went kind of fast because I have a lot of material, and I'm trying to get so, so much of it out within 60 minutes. Okay? Amen. So Amen. thank you again for being here. It's a blessing. Uh, if you can possibly uh, throw on my page, write your comments. I, we need your comments, your feedback. It'll bless other people. If you were blessed, tell people about it. I was on the conference call. I learned something. I was blessed. We need your feedback so other people can see, so more people could join. Well, God wants to teach all of his people, not just some of his people. The devil wants to keep people ignorant, like Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. I would not have you ignorant. We got too many ignorant people in the church. So invite people to the call. Invite them to the session so they can be blessed too. Amen? So, Father, we bless your name. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done and what you're about to do in the people, the lives of your people. Bless these people, Lord, as they go out tonight in their destination. And so the next time I see them, Lord, may the Lord keep them to do, blessing them and keeping them and keeping them, O God, in your perfect peace and your perfect will. Lord, that you will do a mighty thing for them this past, this coming weekend. And we'll give you glory and honor as you impart the beginning stages of the spiritual gifts in this people, in this call. We give the glory, we give the honor, and do praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, Amen. people. God bless you. We'll, We'll see you next week. Take care.